Hi guys, I'm Sue Tranquina, and today we are going to be reviewing Chapter 9 from Clark and Mayer's book, E-Learning and the Science of Instruction, Proven Guidelines for Consumers and Designers of Multimedia Learning, 4th edition. So Chapter 9 will be Applying the Personalization and Embodiment Principles. So the plan for this podcast today is to guide you through the definitions of the personalization as well as the embodiment principles. We'll discuss some of the benefits and some of the watchouts. Um, and then I'm going to give you a personal example along with a little takeaway on how to apply the personalization and embodiment principles in your own practice. So defining the principles, right from Clark and Mayer's book, we have the definitions of the personal personalization principle. People learn more deeply from multimedia lessons when learners experience heightened social presence, as when a conversational script with polite wording or learning agents are used. The embodiment principle is defined as people learn more deeply from on-screen coaches, pedagogical agents, when they use human-like movements, including gestures and eye gaze. Um, uh, the reason why I'm actually doing this as a screencast, despite the amount of takes that I had to do, is because the principle basically says that with me on the screen, you are going to learn better. So I guess that actually to stay here, what I could do is modify some of these definitions to support the personalization and embodiment principle. Um, embodiment, you have me on your screen as opposed to um, a pedagogical agent. Uh, but for the personalization principle, I could say that your learners will learn more deeply from multimedia lessons when they experience heightened social presence from you. As when a conversational script with polite wording or learning agents are used. So what are the benefits of personalization and embodiment? So ultimately, people will learn better, especially beginners, if they feel like the content is being delivered to them. When you make a modification to your conversational style while you're delivering these lessons, ultimately it's gonna result in higher uh, engagement from your students. What I gathered from all of Clark and Mayer's chapter nine, whether you have an agent or you don't on the screen, is that if your learner feels that there's going to be a social presence, that they'll feel engaged in a deeper cognitive process during this learning. Um, ultimately, it's gonna result in a better learning outcome. The learner will feel, feel more invested in the trainer. Um, and then if you reflect back to chapter one, it actually talks about the psychological side of learning where um, when your trainee or your student is more engaged um, and feels like you are actually speaking directly to them, it kind of will tap a little deeper uh, psychologically and it'll cause them to actually retain more information. Clark and Mayer also um, tell the the trainers to really watch out when you're using these personalization and embodiment principles uh, because you want to be pretty modest with the personalization. Um, you can really go overboard on this. I think that after reviewing some of the other principles that are being studied this past week, in all cases, you can o go overboard with, uh, with making modifications to the way that you deliver your trainings. But I think more so too with personalizing this. You know, you don't want to create an inappropriate tone for learning. You don't want the learner to underestimate the seriousness of the training because there's personalization in it. And also, um, you know, another big watch out, and I think that this goes with a lot of e-learning from what I've gathered through Clark and Mayer's reading so far, um, some of these studies are just beginning. So evidence is saying to do this so far. So there is a, a study that I came across on page 185 and 186 in Clark and Mayer's book. Uh, and Moreno and Mayo did this study in 2004, and it was to promote personalization through conversational style. Ultimately, formal versus conversational style. If you define personalization, ultimately you want to have a conversation with your students or with your trainees. Especially in e-learning models, this is going to be really important, but the changes don't have to be drastic. You can really just make modifications to one or two of the words. So this study from Marino and Mayo in 2004 states that in an education-based computer game introduction and other questions, but the one that stuck with me the most as a trainer was this. There was a, a statement in the beginning that basically says, it produces the bright light that people notice as a flashing light. If you just make a modification from people to you, it produces the bright light that you notice as a flash of lightning, then you've personalized your instruction. Throughout their study, Marino and Mayo, 
Mayer found that personal, the personalized groups produced 20 to 45% more solutions to transfer problems than the formal group. If you could get your students to produce 20 to 45% more solutions by just changing the way that you are asking their que the questions or change the way that you are delivering the training, I think that we would all be on board with making these modifications. And then it also said that when a student is feeling engaged, that they're more invested in the trainer and they're more feeling more compelled to listen longer. And like we said, if you reflect back uh, to chapter one, they'll tap more into the psychological background of learning and retaining that information. So this is my little cheat sheet. Um, instead of and trying to use, how do you apply personalization and embodiment? So if I actually jump forward real quick, my example is kind of a little bit more of a general one. I was really shocked at, especially that study um, by Marino and and Mayer, but I was really shocked at the evidence pointing towards just making these slight modifications. And I went through all of my uh, teaching materials from when I do my presentations, as well as as an educator, and I found that I'm not doing this. I'm not personalizing my instruction. And for someone who's a pretty big advocate in personalizing instruction, maybe my delivery is personalized to my students, but all of my materials needed a, a you know, an overhaul, I guess we could say. Um, so while I was on a flight down to North Carolina to do a training, I actually made modifications to my whole presentation. So in my trainings, I'm making modifications throughout the presentation as well as in my materials, so my slide decks um, or any content that I'm sharing out with them. Them. And I'm going to go over the ways that I'm making those modifications on the previous slide. Um, and then in class, my lesson delivery, my screencasts, especially, especially for when I'm out of the classroom. So the students kind of feel like they can still be invested in me as their instructor. Um, and then ultimately all of my materials as well. But jumping right back to how to make modifications to what you're already doing. I have this list of instead ofs and try to use. And I'm actually going to go full screen on this one um, just so that you can see how I have them paired up. Instead of using a formal style of instruction, Clark and Mayer recommend using conversational style of instruction. Instead of third person speech, they recommend using first and second person speech. So rather the um, people, maybe you would go more with you or your or I or she. Instead of direct wording, a little bit more polite wording. I know that uh, some of us in New Jersey could use a little refresher on polite wording, um, but you know, don't bark orders at your trainees, obviously. Using a machine voice, instead you can use a, a friendly human voice. I think that this is really important when you have those on-screen agents. A lot of times people are compelled to use a machine voice if it's a machine that's doing the training, um, but the studies have proven that that is actually detrimental to your students' learning. Um, this this was a really big one. When you have your on-screen agent, you want them to look more human or human-like. As opposed to a cartoon on-screen agent, you don't want to distract your students. Instead, you want to promote the engagement between them. And even if the agent that's on the screen doesn't look entirely human-like, you really don't want it to be a cartoon that, that's there for entertainment value. You want it to be there for content value. And then machine-like movement. So this is all in the embodiment principle, especially if you do have that agent, you want it to have human-like gestures and movement. And then finally, I think all in all, for all of these principles that we're studying, instead of making them elaborate and information packed, lots of bells and whistles, you wanna just try to keep it as simple as possible. It does seem like throughout all of our studying, that um, you know, you want to keep it simple so that your students can can learn as effectively as possible and retain as much information as possible. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you soon.